Chapter Twenty of *The Curse of Capistrano* by Johnston McCulley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty: Don Diego Shows Interest. The threatened rain did not come that day nor that night, and the following morning found the sun shining brightly, and the sky blue, and the scent of blossoms in the air. Soon after the morning meal, the Pulido Careta was driven to the front of the house by Don Diego's servants, and Don Carlos and his wife and daughter prepared to depart for their own hacienda. It desolates me don diego said at the door that there can be no match between the senorita and myself what shall i say to my father do not give up hope caballero don carlos advised him perhaps when we are home again and lolita contrasts our humble abode with your magnificence here she will change her mind a woman changes her mind caballero as often as she does the method of doing her hair i had thought all would be arranged before now don diego said you think there is still hope i trust so don carlos said but he doubted it remembering the look that had been in the senorita's face however he intended having a serious talk with her once they were home and possibly might decide to insist on obedience even in this matter of taking a mate so the usual courtesies were paid and then the lumbering careta was driven away and don diego vega turned back into his house with his head hanging upon his breast as it always hung when he did himself the trouble to think presently he decided that he needed companionship for the moment and left the house to cross the plaza and enter the tavern the fat landlord rushed to greet him conducted him to a choice seat near a window and fetched wine without being commanded to do so don diego spent the greater part of an hour looking through the window at the plaza watching men and women come and go observing the toiling natives and now and then glancing up the trail that ran toward the san gabriel road down this trail presently he observed approaching two mounted men and between their horses walked a third man and don diego could see that ropes ran from this man's waist to the saddles of the horsemen what in the name of saints have we here he exclaimed getting up from the bench and going closer to the window ha said the landlord at his shoulder that will be the prisoner coming now prisoner said don diego looking at him with a question in his glance a native brought the news a short time ago caballero one more affray is in the toils explain fat one the man is to go before the magistrado immediately for his trial they say that he swindled a dealer in hides and now must pay the penalty he wished his trial at san gabriel but that was not allowed since all there are in favor of the missions and the frails who is the man don diego asked he is called fray felipe caballero what is this fray felipe is an old man and my good friend i spent night before the last with him at the hacienda he manages no doubt he has imposed upon you caballero as upon others the landlord said don diego showed some slight interest now he walked briskly from the tavern and went to the office of the magistrado in a little adobe building on the opposite side of the plaza the horsemen were just arriving with their prisoner they were two soldiers who had been stationed at san gabriel the frailes having been forced to give them bed and board in the governor's name it was fray felipe he had been forced to walk the entire distance fastened to the saddles of his guards and there were indications that the horsemen had galloped now and then to test the fray's powers of endurance fray felipe's gown was almost in rags and was covered with dust and perspiration those who crowded around him now gave him jeers and coarse jests but the fray held his head proudly and pretended not to see or hear them 
the soldiers dismounted and forced him into the magistrado's office and the loiterers and natives crowded forward and through the door don diego hesitated a moment and then stepped toward the door one side's come he cried and the natives gave way before him he entered and pressed through the throng the magistrado saw him and beckoned him to a front seat but don diego did not care to sit at that time what is this we have here he demanded this is fra felipe a godly man and my friend he is a swindler one of the soldiers retorted if he is then we can put our trust in no man don diego observed all this is quite irregular caballero the magistrado insisted stepping forward the charges have been preferred and the man is here to be tried then don diego sat down and court was convened the man who made the complaint was an evil-looking fellow who explained that he was a dealer in tallow and hides and had a warehouse in san gabriel i went to the hacienda this fray manages and purchased ten hides of him he testified after giving him the coins in payment and taking them to my storehouse i found that the hides had not been cured properly in fact they were ruined i returned to the hacienda and told the fray as much demanding that he return the money which he refused to do the hides were good fray felipe put in i told him i would return the money when he returned the hides they were spoiled the dealer declared my assistant here will testify as much they caused a stench and i had them burned immediately the assistant testified as much have you anything to say fray the magistrado asked it will avail me nothing fray felipe said i already am found guilty and sentenced were i a follower of a licentious governor instead of a robed franciscan the hides would have been good you speak treason the magistrado cried i speak the truth the magistrado puckered his lips and frowned there's been entirely too much of this swindling he said finally because a man wears a robe he cannot rob with impunity in this case i deem it proper to make an example and the phrase will see they cannot take advantage of their calling the fray must repay the man the price of the hides and for the swindle he shall receive across his bare back ten lashes and for the words of treason he has spoken he shall receive five lashes additional it is a sentence End of chapter 20chapter twenty one of the curse of capistrano by johnston macaulay this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter twenty one the whipping the natives jeered and applauded don diego's face went white and for an instant his eyes met those of fray felipe and in the face of the latter he saw resignation the office was cleared and the soldiers led the fray to the place of execution in the middle of the plaza don diego observed that the magistrado was grinning and he realized what a farce the trial had been these turbulent times he said to a gentleman of his acquaintance who stood near they tore felipe's robe from his back and started to lash him to the post but the fray had been a man of great strength in his day and some of it remained to him in his advanced years and it came to him now what ignominy he was to suffer suddenly he whirled the soldiers aside and stooped to grasp the whip from the ground you have removed my robe he cried i am a man now not a fry one side dogs he lashed out with the whip he cut a soldier across the face he struck at two natives who sprang toward him and then the throng was upon him beating him down kicking and striking at him disregarding even the soldier's orders 
Don Diego Vega felt moved to action. He could not see his friend treated in this manner despite his docile disposition. He rushed into the midst of the throng, calling upon the natives to clear the way. But he felt a hand grasp his arm and turn to look into the eyes of the magistrado. These are no actions for a caballero, the judge said in a low tone. The man has been sentenced properly. When you raise hand to give him aid, you raise hand against his excellency. Have you stopped to think of that, Don Diego Vega? Apparently Don Diego had not, and he realized, too, that he could do no good to his friend by interfering now. He nodded his head to the magistrado and turned away. But he did not go far. The soldiers had subdued Fray Felipe by now and had lashed him to the whipping post. This was added insult, for the post was used for none except insubordinate natives. The lash was swung through the air, and Don Diego saw blood spurt from Fray Felipe's bare back. He turned his face away then, for he could not bear to look but he could count the lashes by the singing of the whip through the air, and he knew that proud old Fray Felipe was making not the slightest sound of pain and would die without doing so. He heard the natives laughing and turned back again to find that the whipping was at an end. The money must be repaid within two days, or you shall have fifteen lashes more. The magistrado was saying, Fray Felipe was untied and dropped to the ground at the foot of the post. The crowd began to melt away. Two frailes who had followed from San Gabriel aided their brother to his feet and led him aside while the natives hooted. Don Diego Vega returned to his house. Senor Bernardo, he ordered his despensero. The butler bit his lip to keep from grinning as he went to do as he was bidden. Bernardo was a deaf and dumb native servant for whom Don Diego had a peculiar use. Within the minute he entered the great living room and bowed before his master. Bernardo, you are a gem, Don Diego said. You cannot speak or hear, cannot write or read, and have not sense enough to make your wants known by the sign language. You are the one man in the world to whom I can speak without having my ears talked off in reply. You do not harm me at every turn. Bernardo bobbed his head as if he understood. He always bobbed his head in that fashion when Don Diego's lips ceased to move. These are turbulent times, Bernardo. Don Diego continued. A man can find no place where he can meditate. Even at Fray Felipe's night before last, there came a big sergeant pounding at the door. A man with nerves is in a sorry state. And this whipping of old Fray Felipe. Bernardo, let us hope that this Signor Zorro, who punishes those who work injustice, hears of the affair and acts accordingly. Bernardo bobbed his head again. As for myself, I am in a pretty pickle. Don Diego went on. My father has ordered that I kept me a wife, and the senorita I selected will have none of me. I shall have my father taking me by the ear in short order. Bernardo, it is time for me to leave this pueblo for a few days. I shall go to the end of my father, to tell him I have got no woman to wed me yet, and ask his indulgence. And there, on the wide hills behind his house, May I hope to find some spot where I may rest and consult the poets for one entire day, without highwaymen and sergeants and unjust magistrados bothering me. And you, Bernardo, shall accompany me, of course. I can talk to you without your taking the words out of my mouth. Bernardo bobbed his head again. He guessed what was to come. It was a habit of Don Diego's to talk to him thus for a long time, and always there was a journey afterward. Bernardo liked that because he worshipped Don Diego and because he liked to visit the hacienda of Don Diego's father where he always was treated with kindness. The despensero had been listening in the other room and had heard what was said, and now he gave orders for Don Diego's horse to be made ready and prepared a bottle of wine and water for the master to take with him. 
within a short time don diego set out bernardo riding mule a short distance behind him they hurried along the high road and presently caught up with the small careta beside which walked two robed franciscans and in which was fray felipe trying to keep back moans of pain don diego dismounted beside the careta as it stopped he went over to it and clasped fray felipe's hands in his own my poor friend he said it is but another instance of injustice fray felipe said for twenty years we of the missions have been subjected to it and it grows the sainted unipero serra invaded this land when other men feared and at san diego de alcala he built the first mission of what became a chain thus giving an empire to the world our mistake was that we prospered we did the work and others reaped the advantages don diego nodded and the other went on they began taking our mission lands from us lands we had cultivated which had formed a wilderness and which my brothers had turned into gardens and orchards they robbed us of worldly goods and not content with that they are now persecuting us the mission empire is doomed caballero the time is not far distant when mission roofs will fall in and the walls crumble away some day people will look at the ruins and wonder how such a thing could come to pass but we can do naught except submit it is one of our principles i did forget myself for a moment in the plaza at reina de los angeles when i took the whip and struck a man it is our lot to submit sometimes mused don diego i wish i were a man of action you give sympathy my friend which is worth its weight in precious stones an action expressed in a wrong channel is worse than no action at all where do you ride to the hacienda of my father good friend i must crave his pardon ask his indulgence he has ordered that i get me a wife and i find it a difficult task that should be an easy task for a vega any maiden would be proud to take that name i had hoped to wed with the senorita lolita pulido she having taken my fancy a worthy maiden her father too has been subjected to unjust oppression did you join your family to his none would dare raise a hand against him all that is very well fry and the absolute truth of course but the senorita will have none of me don diego complained it appears that i have not dash and spirit enough she is hard to please perhaps or possibly she is but playing at being a coquette with the hope of leading you on and increasing your ardour a maid loves to tantalize a man caballero it is her privilege i showed her my house in the pueblo and mentioned my great wealth and agreed to purchase a new carriage for her don diego told him did you show her your heart mention your love and agree to be a perfect husband don diego looked at him blankly then batted his eyes rapidly and scratched at his chin as he did sometimes when he was puzzled over a matter what a perfectly silly idea he exclaimed after a time try it caballero it may have an excellent effect end of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the curse of capistrano by johnston mcculley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter twenty two swift punishment the frailes drove the cart onward fray felipe raised his hand in blessing and don diego vega turned aside into the other trail the deaf and dumb bernardo following at his heels on the mule back in the pueblo the dealer in hides and tallow was the centre of attraction at the tavern the fat landlord was kept busy supplying his guest with wine for the dealer in hides and tallow was spending a part of the money of which he had swindled fray felipe the magistrado was spending the rest there was boisterous laughter as one recounted how fray felipe lay about him with the whip and how the blood spurted from his old back when the lash was applied 
not a whimper from him cried the dealer in hides and tallow he is a courageous old coyote now last month we whipped one at san fernando and he howled for mercy but some men said he had been ill and was weak and possibly that was so a tough lot these frails but it is great sport when we can make one howl more wine landlord fray felipe is paying for it there was a deal of raucous laughter at that and the dealer's assistant who had given perjured testimony was tossed a coin and told to play a man and do his own buying whereupon the apprentice purchased wine for all in the inn and howled merrily when the fat landlord gave him no change from his piece of money are you afraid that you pinch coins the landlord asked those in the tavern howled with merriment again and the landlord who had cheated the assistant to the limit grinned as he went about his business it was a great day for the fat landlord who was the caballero who showed some mercy toward the fray the dealer asked that was don diego vega the landlord replied he will be getting himself into trouble not don diego said the landlord you know the great vega family do you not senor his excellency himself carries their favor did the vegas hold up as much a little finger there would be a political upheaval in these parts then he is a dangerous man the dealer asked a torrent of laughter answered him dangerous don diego vega the landlord cried while tears ran down his fat cheeks you will be the death of me don diego does not but sit in the sun and dream he scarcely ever wears a blade except as a matter of show he groans if he has to ride a few miles on a horse don diego is about as dangerous as a lizard basking in the sun but he is an excellent gentleman for all that the landlord added hastily afraid that his words would reach don diego's ears and don diego would take his custom elsewhere it was almost dusk when the dealer in hides and tallow left the tavern with his assistant and both reeled as they walked for they had partaken of too much wine they made their way to the careta in which they travelled waved their farewells to the group about the door of the tavern and started slowly up the trail toward san gabriel they made their journey in a leisurely manner continuing to drink from a jug of wine they had purchased they went over the crest of the first hill and the pueblo of reina de los angeles was lost to view and all they could see was the highway twisting before them like a great dusty serpent and the brown hills and a few buildings in the distance where some man had his hacienda they made a turning and found a horseman confronting them sitting easily in the saddle with his horse standing across the road in such manner that they could not pass turn your horse turn your beast the dealer in hides and tallow cried would you have me drive over you the assistant gave an exclamation that was part of fear and the dealer looked more closely at the horseman his jaw dropped his eyes bulged tis senor zorro he exclaimed by the saints tis the curse of capistrano away down here near san gabriel you would not bother me senor zorro i am a poor man and have no money only yesterday a fray swindled me and i have been to the riena de los angeles seeking justice did you get it senor zorro asked the magistrado was kind senor he ordered the fray to repay me but i do not know when i shall get the money get out of the careta and your assistant also senor zorro commanded but i have no money the dealer protested out of the careta with you do i have to request it twice move or lead finds a lodging place in your carcass 
Now the dealer saw that the highwayman held a pistol in his hand, and he squealed with sudden fright, and got out of the cart as speedily as possible, his assistant tumbling out at his heels. They stood in the dusty highway before Senor Zorro, trembling with fear, the dealer begging for mercy. "'I have no money with me, kind highwayman, but I shall get it for you,' the dealer cried. I shall carry it to where you say, whenever you wish. Silence, beast! Senor Zorro cried. I do not want your money, perjurer. I know all about the farce of a child at Reina de los Angeles. I have ways of finding out about such things speedily. So the aged fry swindled you, eh? Liar and thief, tis you who are the swindler. And they gave that old and godly man fifteen lashes across his bare back because of the lies you told and you and the magistrato will divide the money of which you swindled him i swear by the saints do not you have done enough false swearing already step forward the dealer complied trembling as if with a disease and senor zorro dismounted swiftly and walked around in front of his horse the dealer's assistant was standing beside the careta, and his face was white. Forward! Senor Zorro commanded again. Again the dealer complied, but suddenly he began to beg for mercy, for Senor Zorro had taken a mule whip from beneath his long cloak and held it ready in his right hand while he held the pistol in his left. Turn your back! he commanded now. Mercy, good highwayman! Am I to be beaten as well as robbed? You would whip an honest merchant because of a thieving fray? The first blow fell, and the dealer shrieked with pain. His last remark appeared to have given strength to the highwayman's arm. The second blow fell, and the dealer in hides and tallow went to his knees in the dusty high road. Then Senor Zorro returned his pistol to his belt and stepped forward and grasped the dealer's mop of hair with his left hand so as to hold him up, and with the right he rained heavy blows with the mule whip upon the man's back until his tough coat and shirt were cut to ribbons and the blood soaked through. That for a man who perjures himself and has an honest fry punished senor zorro cried and then he gave his attention to the assistant no doubt young man you but carried out your master's orders when you lied before the magistrado he said but you must be taught to be honest and fair no matter what the circumstances mercy senor the assistant howled did you not laugh when the fry was being whipped are you not filled with wine now because you have been celebrating the punishment that godly man received for something he did not do senor zorro grasped the youth by the nape of his neck whirled him around and sent a stiff blow at his shoulders the boy shrieked and then began whimpering five lashes in all he received for senor zorro apparently did not wish to render him unconscious and finally he hurled the boy from him and looped his whip let us hope both of you have learned your lesson he said get into the carreta and drive on and when you speak of this occurrence tell the truth else i hear of it and punish you again let me not learn that you have said some fifteen or twenty men surrounded and held you while i worked with a whip the apprentice sprang into the cart and his master followed and they whipped up and disappeared in a cloud of dust toward san gabriel senor zorro looked after them for a time then lifted his mask and wiped the perspiration from his face and then mounted his horse again fastening the mule whip to the pommel of his saddle end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the curse of capistrano by johnston macaulay 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 23 More Punishment Senor Zorro rode quickly to the crest of the hill beneath which was the pueblo, and there he stopped his horse and looked down at the village. It was almost dark, but he could see quite well enough for his purpose. Candles had been lighted in the tavern, and from the building came the sounds of raucous song and loud jest. Candles were burning at the presidio, and from some of the houses came the odor of cooking food. Senor Zorro rode on down the hill. When he reached the edge of the plaza, he put spurs to his horse and dashed up to the tavern door, before which half a dozen men were congregated, the most of them under the influence of wine. Landlord! he cried. None of the men about the door gave him particular attention at first, thinking he was but some caballero on a journey wishing refreshment. The landlord hurried out, rubbing his fat hands together, and stepped close to the horse, and then he saw that the rider was masked, and that the muzzle of a pistol was threatening him. "'Is the magistrado within?' Senor Zorro asked. "'Si, sí, senor.' "'Stand where you are, and pass the word for him. Say there is a caballero here.' who wishes speech with him regarding a certain matter the terrified landlord shrieked for the magistrado and the word was passed inside presently the judge came staggering out crying in a loud voice to know who had summoned him from his pleasant entertainment he staggered up to the horse and put one hand against it and looked up to find two glittering eyes regarding him through a mask he opened his mouth to shriek but senor zorro warned him in time not a sound or you die he said i have come to punish you Today you pass judgment on a godly man who was innocent. Moreover, you knew of his innocence, and his trial was but a farce. By your order, he received a certain number of lashes. You shall have the same payment. You dare! Silence! The highwayman commanded. You about the door there. Come to my side. He called. They crowded forward, the most of them peons who thought that here was a caballero who wished something done and had gold to pay for it. In the dusk they did not see the mask and pistol until they stood beside the horse, and it was too late to retreat then. We are going to punish this unjust magistrado. Senor Zorro told them. The five of you will seize him now and conduct him to the post in the middle of the plaza and there you will tie him the first man to falter receives the slug of lead from my pistol and my blade will deal with the others and i will speed also the frightened magistrado began to screech now laugh loudly that his cries may not be heard the highwayman ordered and the men laughed as loudly as they could albeit there was a peculiar quality to their laughter they seized the magistrado by the arms and conducted him to the post and bound him there with thongs. You will line up, Senor Zorro told them. You will take this whip, and each of you will lash this man five times. I shall be watching, and if I see the whip fall lightly once, I shall deal out punishment. Begin. He tossed the whip to the first man, and the punishment began. Senor Zorro had no fault to find with the manner in which it was given, for there was great fear in the hearts of the peons, and they whipped with strength and willingly. You also, landlord, Senor Zorro said. He will put me in for it afterward. The landlord wailed. Do you prefer a carcel or a coffin, senor? the highwayman asked. It became evident that the landlord preferred the carcel. He picked up the whip, and he surpassed the peons in the strength of his blows. 
the magistrado was hanging heavily from the thongs now unconsciousness had come to him with about the fifteenth blow more through fear than through pain and punishment unfasten the man the highwayman ordered two men sprang forward to do his bidding get him to his house senor zoro went on and tell the people of the pueblo that this is the manner in which senor zoro punishes those who oppress the poor and helpless who give unjust verdicts and who steer in the name of the law go your ways the magistrado was carried away groaning consciousness returning to him now senor zoro turned once more to the landlord we shall return to the tavern he said you will go inside and fetch me a mug of wine and stand beside my horse while i drink it it would be only a waste of breath for me to say what will happen to you if you attempt treachery on the way but there was fear of the magistrado in the landlord's heart as great as his fear of senor zoro he went back to the tavern beside the highwayman's horse and he hurried inside as if to get the wine but he sounded the alarm senor zoro is without he hissed at those nearest the table he has just caused the magistrado to be whipped cruelly he has sent me to get him a mug of wine then he went on to the wine cask and began drawing the drink slowly as possible there was sudden activity inside the tavern some half-dozen caballeros were there men who followed in the footsteps of the governor now they drew their blades and began creeping toward the door and one of them who possessed a pistol and had it in his sash drew it out saw that it was prepared for work and followed in their wake senor zoro sitting his horse some twenty feet from the door of the tavern suddenly beheld a throng rush out at him saw the light flashed from half a dozen blades heard the report of a pistol and heard a ball whistle past his head the landlord was standing in the doorway praying that the highwayman would be captured for then he would be given some credit and perhaps the magistrado would not punish him for having used the lash senor zoro caused his horse to rear high in the air and then raked the beast with the spurs the animals sprang forward into the midst of the caballeros scattering them that was what senor zoro wanted his blade already was out of its scabbard and it passed through a man's sword arm swung over and drew blood on another he fenced like a maniac manoeuvring his horse to keep his antagonists separated so that only one could get at him at a time now the air was filled with shrieks and cries and men came tumbling from the houses to ascertain the cause of the commotion senor zoro knew that some of them would have pistols and while he feared no blade he realized that a man could stand some distance away and cut him down with a pistol ball so he caused his horse to plunge forward again and before the fat landlord realized it senor zoro was beside him and had reached down and grasped him by the arm the horse darted away the fat landlord dragging shrieking for rescue and begging for mercy in the same breath senor zoro rode with him to the whipping post hand me that whip he commanded the shrieking landlord obeyed and called upon the saints to protect him and then senor zoro turned him loose and curled the whip around his fat middle and as the landlord tried to run he cut at him again and again he left him once to charge down upon those who had blades and so scatter them and then he was back with the landlord again applying the whip you tried treachery he cried dog of a thief you would send men about my ears eh i'll strip your tough hide mercy the landlord shrieked and fell to the ground senor zoro cut at him again bringing forth a yell more than blood he wheeled his horse and darted at the nearest of his foes 
another pistol-ball whistled past his head another man sprang at him with blade ready senor zoro ran the man neatly through the shoulder and put spurs to his horse again he galloped as far as the whipping-post and there he stopped his horse and faced them for an instant there are not enough of you to make a fight interesting senores he cried he swept off his sombrero and bowed to them in nice mockery and then he wheeled his horse again and dashed away end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the curse of capistrano by johnston mcculley this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. chapter twenty four at the hacienda of don alejandro behind him he left a tumult in the town the shrieks of the fat landlord had aroused the pueblo men came running servants hurrying at their sides and carrying torches women peered from the windows of the houses natives stood still wherever they happened to be and shivered for it had been their dear experience that whenever there was a tumult natives paid the price many young caballeros of hot blood were there and for some time there had been no excitement in the pueblo of reina de los angeles these young men crowded into the tavern and listened to the wails of the landlord and some hurried to the house of the magistrado and saw his wounds and heard him declaim on the indignity that had been offered the law and therefore his excellency the governor captain ramon came down from the presidio and when he heard the cause of the tumult he swore great oaths and sent his only well man to ride along the pala road overtake sergeant gonzales and his troopers and bid them return and take the trail since at the time being they were following a false scent but the young caballeros saw in this circumstance a chance for excitement that was to their liking and they asked permission of the comandante to form a posse and take after the highwaymen a permission they received immediately some thirty of them mounted horses looked to weapons and set out with the intention of dividing into three bands of ten each when they came to forks in the trail the townsmen cheered them as they started and they galloped rapidly up the hill and toward the san gabriel road making a deal of noise glad that now there was a moon to let them see the foe when they approached him in time they separated ten going toward san gabriel proper ten taking the trail that led to the hacienda of fray felipe and the last ten following a road that curved down the valley to the neighborhood of a series of landed estates owned by wealthy dons of the day along this road don diego vega had ridden some time before the deaf and dumb bernardo behind him on the mule don diego rode with leisure and it was long after nightfall when he turned from the main road and followed a narrower one toward his father's house don alejandro vega the head of the family sat alone at his table the remains of the evening meal before him when he heard a horseman before the door a servant ran to open it and don diego entered bernardo following close behind him ah diego my son the old don cried extending his arms don diego was clasped for an instant to his father's breast and then he sat down beside the table and grasped a mug of wine having refreshed himself he faced don alejandro once more it has been a fatiguing journey he remarked and the cause for it my son i felt that i should come to the hacienda don diego said it is no time to be in the pueblo wherever a man turns he finds naught but violence and bloodshed this confounded senor zorro ha what of him please do not ha me sir and father i have been hot at from morning until night these several days these be turbulent times 
this Signor Zorro has made a visit to the Polido Hacienda and frightened everyone there. I went to my Hacienda on business, and from there I went over to see old Fray Felipe, thinking I might get a chance to meditate in his presence. And who makes an appearance but a big sergeant and his trooper seeking the Signor Zorro? They caught him? I believe not, sir and father. I returned to the Pueblo, and what think you happened there this day? They brought in Fray Felipe, accused of having swindled a dealer, and after a mockery of a trial, they lashed him to a post and gave him the whip fifteen times across his back. The scoundrels! Don Alejandro cried. I could stand it no longer, and so I decided to pay you a visit. Wherever I turn, there is turmoil. It is enough to make a man insane. You may ask Bernardo if it is not. Don Alejandro glanced at the deaf and dumb native and grinned. Bernardo grinned back as a matter of course, not knowing it was no manner in which to act in the presence of a don. You have something else to tell me? Don Alejandro asked his son, looking at him searchingly. By the saints, now it comes. I'd hope to avoid it, father and sir. Let me hear about it. I paid a visit to the Polido Hacienda, and spoke with Don Carlos and his wife, also the Signorita Lolita. You were pleased with the Signorita? She is as lovely as any girl of my acquaintance. Don Diego said. I spoke to Don Carlos of the matter of marriage, and he appeared to be delighted. Ah, he would be, said Don Alejandro. But the marriage cannot take place, I fear. How is this? There is some shadow concerning the Signorita? Not to my knowledge. She appears to be a sweet and innocent maiden, father and sir. I had them come to Reina de los Angeles and spend a couple of days at my house. I had it arranged so that she could see the furnishings and learn of my wealth. That was a wise arrangement, my son. But she will have none of me. How is this? Refuses to wed with a vega? Refuses to become allied to the most powerful family in the country? with the best blood in the land? She intimated, father and sir, that I am not the sort of man for her. She is prone to foolishness, I believe. She would have me play a guitar under her window, perhaps, and make eyes, and hold hands when her duenna is not looking, and all that silliness. By the saints, are you a vega? Don Alejandro cried. Would not any worthy man want a chance like that? Would not any caballero delight to serenade his love on a moonlight night? The little things you term silly are the very essence of love. I doubt not the senorita was displeased with you. But I did not see that such things were necessary, Don Diego said. Did you go to the senorita in a cold-blooded manner and suggest that you wed and have it done with? Had you the idea, young sir, that you were purchasing a horse or a bull? By the saints! And so there is no chance for you to wed the girl? She has the best blood by far, next to our own. Don Carlos bade me have hope, Diego replied. He took her back to the hacienda, and suggested that perhaps, when she had been there a time, and had reflected she might change her mind. She is yours if you play the game, Don Alejandro said. You are a vega, and therefore the best catch in the country. Be but half a lover, and the senorita is yours. What sort of blood is in your veins? I have half a mind to slit one of them and see. Cannot we allow this marriage business to drop for the time being? Don Diego asked. You are twenty-five. I was quite old when you were born. Soon I shall go the way of my father's. You are the only son, the heir, and you must have a wife and offspring. Is the Vega family to die out because your blood is water? Win your wife within the quarter year, young sir, and a wife I can accept into the family, or I leave my wealth to the Franciscans when I pass away my father i mean it get life into you i would you had half the courage and spirit the signor zorro this highwayman has he has principles and he fights for them 
he aids the helpless and avenges the oppressed i salute him i would rather have you my son in his place running the risk of death or imprisonment than to have you a lifeless dreamer of dreams that amount to naught my father i have been a dutiful son i would you had been a little wild it would have been more natural don alejandro sighed i could overlook a few escapades more easily than i can lifelessness arouse yourself young sir remember that you are a vega when i was your age i was not a laughing-stock i was ready to fight at a wink to make love to every pair of flashing eyes to stand up to any caballero in sports rough or refined ha i pray you do not ha me sir and father my nerves are on edge you must be more of a man i shall attempt it immediately don diego said straightening himself somewhat in his chair i had hoped to avoid it but it appears that i cannot i shall woo the senorita lolita as other men woo maidens you meant what you said about your fortune i did said don alejandro then i must bestir myself it would never do of course to let that fortune go out of the family i shall think these matters over in peace and quiet to-night perhaps i can meditate here far from the pueblo by the saints the last exclamation was caused by a sudden tumult outside the house don alejandro and his son heard a number of horsemen stop heard their calls to one another heard bridles jingling and blades rattling there is no peace in all the world don diego said with deepened gloom it sounds like half a score of men don alejandro said it was exactly a servant opened the door and into the great room there strode ten caballeros with blades at their sides and pistols in their belts ha don alejandro we crave hospitality the foremost cried you have it without asking caballeros what manner of journey is this you take we pursue senor zorro the highwayman by the saints don diego cried one cannot escape it even here violence and bloodshed he invaded the plaza at reno de los angeles the spokesman went on he had the magistrado whipped because he sentenced fray felipe to receive the lash and he whipped the fat landlord and he fought half a score of men while he was about it then he rode away and we made up a band to pursue him he has not been in this neighborhood not to my knowledge don alejandro said my son arrived off the highway but a short time ago you did not see the fellow don diego i did not don diego said that is one stroke of good fortune that came my way don alejandro had sent for servants and now wine mugs were on the long table and heaps of small cakes and the caballeros began to eat and drink don diego knew well what that meant their pursuit of the highwaymen was at an end their enthusiasm had waned they would sit at his father's table and drink throughout the night gradually getting intoxicated shout and sing and tell stories and in the morning ride back to reina de los angeles like so many heroes it was the custom the chase of senor zorro was but a pretext for a merry time the servants brought great stone jugs filled with rare wine and put them on the table and don alejandro ordered that meat be fetched also the young caballeros had a weakness for these parties at don alejandro's for the don's good wife had been dead for several years and there were no women-folk except servants and so they could make what noise they pleased throughout the night in time they put aside pistols and blades and began to boast and brag and don alejandro had his servants put the weapons in a far corner out of the way for he did not wish a drunken quarrel with a dead caballero or two in his house don diego drank and talked with them for a time and then sat to one side and listened as if such foolishness bored him 
it were well for the senor zorro that we did not catch up with him one cried any one of us is a match for the fellow were the soldiers men of merit he would have been taken long before this ha huh, for a chance at him another screeched how the landlord did howl when he was whipped he rode in this direction don alejandro asked we are not so sure as to that he took the san gabriel trail and thirty of us followed we separated into three bands each going a different direction it is the good fortune of one of the other bands to have him now i suppose but it is our excellent good fortune to be here don diego stood before the company senores you will pardon me i know if i retire he said i am fatigued with the journey retire by all means one of his friends cried and when you are rested come out to us again and make merry they laughed at that and don diego bowed ceremoniously and observed that several scarcely could get to their feet to bow in return and then the scion of the house of vega hurried from the room with the deaf and dumb man at his heels he entered a room that always was ready for him and in which a candle already was burning and closed the door behind him and bernardo stretched his big form on the floor just outside it to guard his master during the night in the great living-room don diego scarcely was missed his father was frowning and twisting his moustache for he would have had his son like other young men in his youth he was remembering he never left such a company early in the evening and once again he sighed and wished that the saints had given him a son with red blood in his veins the caballeros were singing now joining in the chorus of a popular love-song and their discordant voices filled the big room don alejandro smiled as he listened for it brought his own youth back to him they sprawled on chairs and benches on both sides of the long table pounding it with their mugs as they sang laughing boisterously now and then were this senor zorro only here now one of them cried a voice from the doorway answered him senores he is here end of chapter twenty four Chapter Twenty Five of The Curse of Capistrano by Johnston McCulley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Five A League is Formed. The song ceased, the laughter was stilled. They bunked their eyes and looked across the room senor zorro stood just inside the door having entered from the veranda without them knowing it he wore his long cloak and his mask and in one hand he held his accursed pistol and its muzzle was pointed at the table so these are the manner of men who pursue senor zorro and hope to take him he said make not a move else lead flies your weapons i perceive are in the corner i could kill some of you and be gone before you could reach them tis he tis he a tipsy caballero was crying your noise may be heard a mile away senores what a posse to go pursuing a man is this the way you attend to duty why have you stopped to make merry while senor zorro rides the highway give me my blade and let me stand before him one cried if i allowed you to have blade you would be unable to stand the highwayman answered think you there is one in this company who could fence with me now there is one cried don alejandro in a loud voice springing to his feet i openly say that i have admired some of the things you have done senor but now you have entered my house and are abusing my guests and i must call you to account i have no quarrel with you don alejandro and you have none with me 
Senor Zorro said. I refuse to cross blades with you, and I am but telling these men some truths. By the saints, I shall make you. A moment, Don Alejandro. Senores, this aged Don would fight me, and that would mean a wound or death for him. Will you allow it? Don Alejandro must not fight our battles, one of them cried. Then see that he sits in his place, and all honor to him. Don Alejandro started forward, but two of the caballeros sprang before him and urged him to go back, saying that his honor was safe since he offered combat. Raging, Don Alejandro complied. A worthy bunch of young blades, Senor Zorro sneered. You drink wine and make merry while injustice is all about you take your swords in hand and attack oppression live up to your noble names and your blue blood senores drive the thieving politicians from the land protect the fridays whose work gave us these broad acres be men not drunken fashion plates by the saints one cried and sprang to his feet back or i fire i have not come here to fight you in don alejandro's house i respect him too much for that i have come to tell you these truths concerning yourselves your families can make or break a governor band yourselves together in a good cause caballeros and make some use of your lives you would do it were you not afraid you seek adventure here is adventure aplenty fighting injustice by the saints it would be a lark cried one in answer look upon it as a lark if it pleases you yet you would be doing some good would the politicians dare stand against you scions of the most powerful families band yourselves together and give yourselves a name make yourselves feared the length and breadth of the land it would be treason it is not treason to down a tyrant caballeros is it that you are afraid by, by the, the saints, saints no. no they cried in chorus then make your stand you, you would lead us, us? si senores but stay are you of good blood i am a caballero of blood as good as any here senor zorro told them your name where resides your family those things must remain secrets for the present i have given you my word your face must remain masked for the time being senores they had lurched to their feet now and were acclaiming him wildly stay one cried this is an imposition upon don alejandro he may not be in sympathy and we are planning and plotting in his house i am in sympathy caballeros and give you my support don alejandro said their cheers filled the great room none could stand against them if don alejandro vega was with them not even the governor himself would dare oppose them tis a bargain they cried we shall call ourselves the avengers we shall ride el camino real and prove terrors to those who rob honest men and mistreat natives we shall drive the thieving politicians out and then you should be caballeros in truth knights protecting the weak senor zorro said never shall you repent this decision senores i lead and i give you loyalty and expect as much also i expect obedience to orders what, what shall, shall we, we do? do they cried let this remain a secret in the morning return to reino de los angeles and say you did not find senor zorro say rather that you did not catch him which will be the truth be ready to band yourself together and ride i shall send word when the time arrives in what manner i know you all i shall get word to one and he can inform the others it is agreed agreed, agreed. 
they shouted. Then I will leave you here and now. You are to remain in this room, and none is to try to follow me. It is a command. Buenos noches, caballeros. He bowed before them, swung the door open, and darted through it and slammed it shut behind him. They could hear the clatter of a horse's hoofs on the driveway, and then they raised their wine mugs and drank to their new league for the suppression of swindlers and thieves, and to Senor Zorro, the curse of Capistrano, and to Don Alejandro Vega, somewhat sobered by the agreement they had made and what it meant. They sat down again and began speaking of wrongs that should be righted, each of them knowing half a dozen. And Don Alejandro Vega sat in one corner by himself, a grief-stricken man because his only son was asleep in the house and had not red blood enough to take a part in such an undertaking when, by all rights, he should be one of the leaders. As if to add to his misery, Don Diego at that moment came slowly into the room, rubbing his eyes and yawning and looking as if he had been disturbed. It is impossible for a man to sleep in this house tonight, he said. Give me a mug of wine and I shall take my place with you. Why was the cheering? Signor Zorro has been here, his father began. The highwayman been here. By the saints, it is as much as a man can endure. Sit down, my son, Don Alejandro urged. Certain things have come to pass. There will be a chance now for you to show what sort of blood flows in your veins. Don Alejandro's manner was very determined. End of chapter 25《ハプスト・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・シャプター・And in making plans to be submitted to Senor Zorro for his approval, and though they appeared to look upon this thing as a lark and a means to adventure, yet there was an undercurrent of seriousness in their manner, for they knew well the state of the times and realized that things were not as they should be, and in reality they were exponents of fairness to all. They had thought of these things often, but had made no move because they had not been banded together and had no leader, and each young caballero waited for another to start the thing. But now this Senor Zorro had struck at the psychological moment and things could be done. Don Diego was informed of the state of affairs, and his father informed him, likewise, that he was to play a part and prove himself a man. Don Diego fumed considerably and declared that such a thing would cause his death, yet he would do it for his father's sake. Early in the morning the caballeros ate a meal that Don Alejandro caused to be prepared, and then they started back to Reina de los Angeles, Don Diego riding with them at his father's order. Nothing was to be said about their plans. They were to get recruits from the remainder of the thirty who had set out in pursuit of Senor Zorro. Some would join them readily, they knew, while others were the governor's men, pure and simple, and would have to be kept in the dark concerning the thing contemplated. They rode leisurely, for which Don Diego remarked that he was grateful. Bernardo was still following him on the mule, and was a little chagrined because Don Diego had not remained longer at his father's house. Bernardo knew something momentous was being planned, but could not guess what, of course, and wished that he was like other men and could hear and speak. When they reached the plaza, they found that the other two parties already were there, saying that they had not come up with the highwaymen. 
some declared that they had seen him in the distance and one that he had fired a pistol at him at which the caballeros who had been at don alejandro's put their tongues in their cheeks and looked at one another in a peculiar manner don diego left his companions and hurried to his house where he donned fresh clothing and refreshed himself generally he sent bernardo about his business which was to sit in the kitchen and await his master's call and then he ordered his carriage around that carriage was one of the most gorgeous along el camino real and why don diego had purchased it had always been a mystery there were some who said he did it to show his wealth while others declared a manufacturer's agent had worried him so much that don diego had given him the order to be rid of him don diego came from his house dressed in his best but he did not get into the carriage again there was a tumult in the plaza and into it rode sergeant pedro gonzalez and his troopers the man captain ramon had sent after them had overtaken them easily for they had been riding slowly and had not covered many miles ah don diego my friend gonzalez cried still living in this turbulent world from necessity don diego replied did you capture this senor zorro oh the pretty bird escaped us caballero it appears that he turned toward his son gabriel that night while we went chasing him toward pala ah well tis nothing to make a small mistake our revenge shall be the greater when we find him what do you do now my sergeant my men refresh themselves and then we ride toward san gabriel it is said the highwayman is in that vicinity though some thirty young men of blood failed to find him last night after he had caused the magistrado to be whipped no doubt he hid himself in the brush and chuckled when the caballeros rode by may your horse have speed and your sword arm strength don diego said and got into his carriage two magnificent horses were hitched to the carriage and a native coachman in rich livery drove them don diego stretched back on the cushions and half closed his eyes as the carriage started the driver went across the plaza and turned into the highway and started toward the hacienda of don carlos pulido sitting on his veranda don carlos saw the gorgeous carriage approaching and growled low down in his throat and then got up and hurried into the house to face his wife and daughter senorita don diego comes he said i have spoken words regarding the young man and i trust that you have given heed to them as a dutiful daughter should then he turned and went out to the veranda again and the senorita rushed into her room and threw herself upon a couch to weep the saints knew she wished that she could feel some love for don diego and take him for a husband for it would help her father's fortunes yet she felt that she could not why did not the man act the caballero why did he not exhibit a certain measure of common sense why did he not show that he was a young man bursting with health instead of acting like an aged don with one foot in the grave don diego got from the carriage and waved to the driver to continue to the stable-yard he greeted don carlos languidly and don carlos was surprised to note that don diego had a guitar beneath one arm he put the guitar down on the floor removed his sombrero and sighed i have been out to see my father he said ha ah, don alejandro is well i hope he is in excellent health as usual he has instructed me to persist in my suit for the senorita lolita's hand if i do not win me a wife within a certain time he says he will give his fortune to the franciscans when he passes away indeed he said it and my father is not a man to waste his words don carlos i must win the senorita i know of no other young woman who would be as acceptable to my father as a daughter-in-law a little wooing don diego i beg of you be not so matter-of-fact i pray 
I have decided to woo as other men, though it no doubt will be much of a bore. How would you suggest that I start? It is difficult to give advice in such a case. Don Carlos replied, trying desperately to remember how he had done it when he had courted Doña Catalina. A man really should be experienced, else be a man to whom such things come naturally. I fear I am neither. Don Diego said, sighing again and raising tired eyes to Don Carlos's face. It might be an excellent thing to regard the senorita as if you adored her. Say nothing about marriage at first, but speak rather of love. Try to talk in low, rich tones, and say those meaningless nothings in which a young woman can find a world of meaning. Tis a gentle art saying one thing and meaning another i fear that it is beyond me don diego said yet i must try of course i may see the senorita now don carlos went to the doorway and called his wife and daughter and the former smiled upon don diego in encouragement and the latter smiled also yet with fear and trembling for she had given her heart to the unknown Senor Zorro, and could love no other man, and could not wed where she did not love, not even to save her father from poverty. Don Diego conducted the senorita to a bench at one end of the veranda, and started to talk of things in general, plucking at the strings of his guitar as he did so, while Don Carlos and his wife removed themselves to the other end of the veranda and hoped that things would go well. Senorita Lolita was glad that Don Diego did not speak of marriage as he had done before. Instead, he told of what had happened in the Pueblo, of Fray Felipe's whipping, and of how Senor Zorro had punished the magistrado and fought a dozen men and made his escape. Despite his air of languor, Don Diego spoke in an interesting manner, and the senorita found herself liking him more than before. He told, too, of how he had gone to his father's hacienda, and of how the caballeros had spent the night there, drinking and making merry, but he said nothing of Senor Zorro's visit and the league that had been formed, having taken his oath not to do so my father threatens to disinherit me if i do not get my wife within a specified time don diego said then would you like to see me lose my father's estate senorita certainly not she replied there are many girls who would be proud to wed you don diego but not you certainly i would be proud but can a girl help it if her heart does not speak would you wish a wife who did not love you Think of the long years you would have to spend beside her, and no love to make them endurable. You do not think, then, that you ever could learn to love me, senorita? Suddenly the girl faced him and spoke in lower tones and earnestly. You are a caballero of the blood, senor. I may trust you. To death, senorita. Then I have something to tell you, and I ask that you let it remain your secret. It is an explanation in a way. Proceed, senorita. If my heart bade me do so, nothing would please me more than to become your wife, senor, for I know that it would mend my father's fortunes. But perhaps I am too honest to wed where I do not love. There is one great reason why I cannot love you. There is some other man in your heart? You have guessed it, senor. My heart is filled with his image. You would not want me for wife in such a case. My parents do not know. You must keep my secret. I swear by all the saints I have spoken the truth. The man is worthy. I feel sure that he is, Caballero. Did he prove to be otherwise, I should grieve my life away. Yet I never could love another man. You understand now? I understand fully, Senorita. May I express the hope that you will find him worthy, and in time the man of your choice? I knew you would be the true Caballero. And if things should go amiss, and you need a friend, command me, Senorita. My father must not suspect at the present time. We must let him think that you still seek me, and I will pretend to be thinking more of you than before, and gradually you can cease your visits. I understand, senorita. Yet that leaves me in bad case. I have asked your father for permission to woo you, and if I go to wooing another girl now, 
I will have him about my ears in just anger. And if I do not woo another girl, I shall have my own father upbraiding me. It is a sorry state. Perhaps it will not be for long, Signor. Ha! Huh, I have it. What does a man do when he is disappointed in love? He mopes, he pulls a long face, he refuses to partake of the actions and excitements of the times. Signorita, you have saved me in a way. I shall languish because you do not return my love. Then men will think they know the reason when I dream in the sun and meditate instead of riding and fighting like a fool. I shall be allowed to go my way in peace, and there shall be a romantic glamour cast about me. An excellent thought. Signor, you are incorrigible. The Senorita Lolita exclaimed, laughing. Don Carlos and Doña Catalina heard that laugh, looked around, and then exchanged quick glances. Don Diego Vega was getting along famously with the Senorita, they thought. Then Don Diego continued the deception by playing his guitar and singing a verse of a song that had to do with bright eyes and love. Don Carlos and his wife glanced at each other again, this time in apprehension, and wished that he would stop, for the scion of the Vegas had many superiors as musician and vocalist, and they feared that he might lose what ground he had gained in the senorita's estimation. But if Lolita thought little of the caballero's singing, she said nothing to that effect, and she did not act displeased. There was some more conversation, and just before the siesta hour, Don Diego bade them buenos dias and rode away in his gorgeous carriage. From the turn in the driveway, he waved back at them. End of chapter 26「twenty seven of the Curse of Capistrano by Johnston Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter twenty seven Orders for Arrest Captain Ramon's courier, sent north with the letter for the governor, had dreams of gay times in San Francisco de Assis before returning to his presidio at Reina de Los Angeles. He knew a certain senorita there, whose beauty caused his heart to burn. So he rode like a fiend after leaving his comandante's office, changed mounts at San Fernando and at an hacienda along the way, and galloped into Santa Barbara a certain evening just at dusk, with the intention of changing horses again, getting meat and bread and wine at the presidio, and rushing on his way. And, at Santa Barbara, his hopes of basking in the senorita's smiles at San Francisco de Assis were cruelly shattered, for before the door of the presidio there was a gorgeous carriage that made Don Diego's appear like a careta, and a score of horses were tethered there, and more troopers than were stationed at Santa Barbara regularly moved about the highway, laughing and jesting with one another the governor was in santa barbara his excellency had left san francisco de assis some days before on a trip of inspection and intended to go as far south as san diego de alcala strengthening his political fences rewarding his friends and awarding punishment to his enemies he had reached Santa Barbara an hour before, and was listening to the report of the Comandante there, after which he intended remaining during the night with a friend. His troopers were to be given quarters at the Presidio, of course, and the journey was to continue on the morrow. Captain Ramon's courier had been told that the letter he carried was of the utmost importance, and so he hurried to the office of the Comandante and entered it like a man of rank. I come from Captain Ramon, Comandante at Reina de los Angeles, with a letter of importance for His Excellency he reported standing stiffly at salute the governor grunted and took the letter and the comandante motioned for the courier to withdraw 
his excellency read the letter with speed and when he had finished there was an unholy gleam in his eyes and he twirled his moustache with every evidence of keen satisfaction and then he read the letter again and frowned he liked the thought that he could crush don carlos pulido more but he disliked to think that senor zorro the man who had affronted him was still at liberty he got up and paced the floor for a time and then whirled upon the comandante i shall leave for the south at sunrise he said my presence is urgently needed at reina de los angeles you will attend to things tell that courier he shall ride back with my escort i go now to the house of my friend and so in the morning the governor started south his escort of twenty picked troopers surrounding him the courier in their midst he travelled swiftly and on a certain day at mid-morning entered the plaza of reina de los angeles unheralded it was the same morning that don diego rode to the pulido hacienda in his carriage taking his guitar with him the cavalcade stopped before the tavern and the fat landlord almost suffered an apoplexy because he had not been warned of the governor's coming and was afraid he would enter the inn and find it in a dirty state but the governor made no effort to leave his carriage and enter the tavern he was glancing around the square observing many things he never felt secure concerning the men of rank in this pueblo he felt that he did not have the proper grip on them now he watched carefully as news of his arrival was spread and certain caballeros hurried to the plaza to greet him and make him welcome he noted those who appeared to be sincere observed those who were in no particular haste to salute him and noticed that several were absent business must receive his first attention he told them and he must hasten up to the presidio after that he would gladly be the guest of any of them he accepted an invitation and ordered his driver to proceed he was remembering captain ramon's letter and he had not seen don diego vega in the plaza sergeant gonzales and his men were away pursuing senor zorro of course and so captain ramon himself was awaiting his excellency at the presidio entrance and saluted him gravely and bowed low before him and ordered the commander of the escort to take charge of the place and police it stationing guards in honor of the governor he led his excellency to the private office and the governor sat down what is the latest news he asked my men are on the trail excellency but as i wrote this pest of the senor zorro has friends a legion of them i take it my sergeant has reported that twice he found him with a band of followers they must be broken up killed off the governor cried a man of that sort always can get followers and yet more followers until he will be so strong that he can cause us serious trouble has he committed any further atrocities he has excellency yesterday a fry from san gabriel was whipped for swindling senor zorro caught the witnesses against him on the high road and whipped them almost to death and then he rode into the pueblo just at dusk and had the magistrato whipped my soldiers were away looking for him at the time it appears that this senor zorro knows the movements of my force and always strikes where the troopers are not then spies are giving him warnings it appears so excellency last night some thirty young caballeros rode after him but did not find track of the scoundrel they returned this morning was don diego vega with them he did not ride out with them but he returned with them it seems that they picked him up at his father's hacienda you perhaps guessed that i mean the vegas in my letter i am convinced now your excellency that my suspicions in that quarter were unjust the senor zorro even invaded don diego's house one night while don diego was away how is this but don carlos pulido and his family were there ha in don diego's house what is the meaning of that it is amusing said captain ramon laughing lightly i have heard that don alejandro ordered don diego to get him a wife the young man is not the sort to woo women 
is lifeless. I know the man. Proceed. So he rides straight away to the hacienda of Don Carlos and asks permission to pay his addresses to Don Carlos's only daughter. Senor Zorro was abroad and Don Diego, going to his own hacienda, on business, asked Don Carlos to come to the pueblo with his family where it would be safer and occupied his house until he returned. The pulidos could not refuse, of course, and Senor Zorro, it appears, followed them. Ha! Go on. It is laughable that Don Diego fetched them here to escape Senor Zorro's wrath, when in reality they are hand in glove with the highwayman. Remember, this Senor Zorro had been caught at the Pulido Hacienda. We got word from a native, and almost caught him there. He had been eating a meal. He was hiding in the closet, and while I was alone there, and my men searching the trails, he came from the closet, ran me through the shoulder from behind, and escaped. The low scoundrel! The governor exclaimed. But do you think there will be a marriage between Don Diego and the Senorita Pulido? I imagine there need be no worry in that regard, Excellency. I am of the opinion that Don Diego's father put a flea in his ear. He probably called Don Diego's attention to the fact that Don Carlos does not stand very high with your Excellency, and that there are daughters of other men who do. At any rate, the Pulidos returned to their hacienda after Don Diego's return. Don Diego called upon me here at the Presidio and appeared to be anxious that I would not think him a man of treason. I am glad to hear it. The Vegas are powerful. They never have been my warm friends, yet never have they raised hands against me, so I cannot complain. It is good sense to keep them friendly, if that be possible. But these pulidos... Even the senorita appears to be giving aid to this highwayman. Captain Ramon said... She boasted to me of what she called his courage. She sneered at the soldiers. Don Carlos Pulido and some of the frailes are protecting the man, giving him food and drink, hiding him, sending him news of the trooper's whereabouts. The Pulidos are hindering our efforts to capture the rogue. I would have taken steps, but I thought it best to inform you and await your decision. There can be but one decision in such a case said the governor loftily no matter how good a man's blood may be or what his rank he cannot be allowed to commit treason without suffering the consequences i had thought that don carlos had learned his lesson but it appears that he has not are any of your men in the presidio some who are ill excellency that courier of yours returned with my escort does he know the country well hereabouts certainly excellency he has been stationed here for some time then he can act as a guide send half my escort at once to the hacienda of don carlos pulido have them arrest the don and fetch him to carcel and incarcerate him there that'll be a blow to his high blood i've had quite enough of these pulidos and the hoti dona who sneered at me and the proud senorita who scorned the troopers Ha. It is a good thought. It will teach a lesson to all in this locality. Have them fetched to Carcel and incarcerated also. The governor said. End of chapter 27「Chapter 28 of The Curse of Capistrano by Johnston Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 28 The Outrage Don Diego's carriage had just pulled up before his house when a squad of troopers went by it in a cloud of dust. He did not recognize any of them for men he had seen about the tavern. Ha! <sighs> There are new soldiers on the trail of Signor Zorro, he asked a man standing near. They are a part of the escort of the governor, Caballero. The governor is here? He arrived but a short time ago, Caballero, and has gone to the Presidio. I suppose they must have fresh news of this highwayman to send them riding furiously through dust and sun like that. He appears to be an elusive rascal. By the saints! Had I been here when the governor arrived, no doubt he would have put up at my house. 
now some other caballero will have the honor of entertaining him it is much to be regretted and then don diego went into the house and the man who had heard him speak did not know whether to doubt the sincerity of that last remark led by the courier who knew the way the squad of troopers galloped swiftly along the high road and presently turned up the trail toward don carlos's house they went at this business as they would have gone about capturing a desperado as they struck the driveway they scattered to left and right tearing up doña catalina's flower beds and sending chickens squawking out of the way and so surrounded the house in almost an instant of time don carlos had been sitting on the veranda in his accustomed place half in a doze and he did not notice the advance of the troopers until he heard the beating of their horses hoofs he got to his feet in alarm wondering whether senor zorro was in the vicinity again and the soldiers after him three dismounted in a cloud of dust before the steps and the sergeant who commanded them made his way forward slapping the dust from his uniform you are don carlos pulido he asked in a loud voice i have that honor senor i have orders to place you under military arrest arrest don carlos cried who gave you such orders his excellency the governor he is now in reina de los angeles senor and the charge treason and aiding the enemies of the state preposterous don carlos cried i am accused of treason when though the victim of oppression i have withheld my hand against those in power what are the particulars of the charges you will have to ask the magistrado that senor i know nothing of the matter except that i am to arrest you you wish me to accompany you i demand it senor i am a man of blood a caballero i have my orders so i cannot be trusted to appear at my place of trial but perhaps the hearing is to be held immediately so much the better for all the quicker can i clear myself we go to the presidio i go to the presidio when this work is done you go to carcel the sergeant said to carcel don carlos screeched you would dare you would throw a caballero into the filthy jail you would place him where they keep insubordinate natives and common felons i have my orders senor you will prepare to accompany us at once i must give my superintendent instructions regarding the management of the hacienda i'll go along with you senor don carlos's face flamed purple his hands clenched as he regarded the sergeant am i to be insulted with every word he cried do you think i would run away like a criminal i have my orders senor the sergeant said at least i may break this news to my wife and daughter without an outsider being at my shoulder your wife is doña catalina pulido certainly i am ordered to arrest her also senor scum don carlos cried you would put hands on a lady you would remove her from her house it is my orders she too is charged with treason and with aiding the enemies of the state by the saints it is too much i shall fight against you and your men as long as there is breath in my body and that will not be for long don carlos if you attempt to give battle i am but carrying out my orders my beloved wife placed under arrest like a native wench and on such a charge what are you to do with her sergeant she goes to carcel my wife in that foul place is there no justice in the land she is a tender lady of noble blood enough of this senor my orders are my orders and i carry them out as instructed i am a soldier and i obey now doña catalina came running to the veranda for she had been listening to the conversation just inside the door 
her face was white but there was a look of pride in it she feared don carlos might make an attack on the soldier and she feared he would be wounded or slain if he did and knew that at least it could only double the charge held against him you have heard don carlos asked i have heard my husband it is but more persecution i am too proud to argue the point with these common soldiers who are but doing as they have been commanded a pulido can be a pulido my husband even in a foul carcel but the shame of it don carlos cried what does it all mean where will it end and our daughter will be here alone with the servants we have no relatives no friends your daughter is senorita lolita pulido the sergeant asked then do not grieve senor for you will not be separated i have an order for the arrest of your daughter also the charge the same senor and you would take her to carcel an innocent high-born gentle girl my orders senor said the sergeant may the saints blast the man who issued them don carlos cried they have taken my wealth and lands they have heaped shame upon me and mine but thank the saints they cannot break our pride and then don carlos's head went erect and his eyes flashed and he took his wife by the arm and turned about to enter the house with the sergeant at his heels he broke the news to the senorita lolita who stood as if stricken dumb for an instant and then burst into a torrent of tears and then the pride of the pulidos came to her and she dried her eyes and curled her pretty lips with scorn at the big sergeant and pulled aside her skirts when he stepped near servants brought the careta before the door and don carlos and his wife and daughter got into it and the journey of shame to the pueblo began their hearts might be bursting with grief but not one of the pulidos showed it their heads were held high they looked straight ahead they pretended not to hear the low taunts of the soldiers they passed others who were crowded off the road by the troopers and who looked with wonder at those in the careta but they did not speak some watched in sorrow and some grinned at their plight according to whether those who passed were of the governor's party or of the honest folk who abhorred injustice and so finally they came to the edge of reina de los angeles and there they met fresh insult for his excellency had determined that the pulido should be humbled to the dust and he had sent some of his troopers to spread news of what was being done and to give coins to natives and peons if they would jeer the prisoners when they arrived for the governor wished to teach a lesson that would prevent other noble families from turning against him and wished it to appear that the pulidos were hated by all classes alike at the edge of the plaza they were met by the mob there were cruel jeers and jests some of which no innocent senorita should have heard don carlos's face was red with wrath and there were tears in doña catalina's eyes and senorita lolita's lips were trembling but they gave no other sign that they heard the drive around the plaza to the carcel was made slow purposely at the door of the inn there was a throng of rascals who had been drinking wine at the expense of the governor and these added to the din one man threw mud and it splashed on don carlos's breast but he refused to notice it he had one arm around his wife the other around his daughter as if to give them what protection he could and he was looking straight ahead there were some men of blood who witnessed the scene yet took no part in the tumult some of them were as old as don carlos and this thing brought to their hearts fresh yet passive hatred of the governor 
and some were young, with the blood running hot in their veins, and they looked upon the suffering face of Doña Catalina, and imagined her their own mother, and upon the lovely face of the senorita, and imagined her their sister or betrothed. And some of these men glanced at one another furtively, and though they did not speak, they were wondering the same thing, whether Senor Zorro would hear of this, and whether he would send word around for the members of the new league to gather. The careta stopped before the carcel finally, the mob of jeering natives and peons surrounding it. The soldiers made some pretense of holding them back, and the sergeant dismounted and forced Don Carlos and his wife and daughter to step to the ground uncouth and intoxicated men jostled them as they walked up the steps to the door more mud was thrown and some of it spattered upon doña catalina's gown but if the mob expected an outburst on the part of the aged caballero it was disappointed don carlos held his head high ignoring those who were striving to torment him and so led his ladies to the door the sergeant beat against it with the heavy hilt of his sword an aperture was opened and in it appeared the evil grinning face of the jailer what have we here he demanded three prisoners charged with treason the sergeant replied the door was thrown open there came a last burst of jeers from the mob and then the prisoners were inside and the door had been closed and bolted again the jailer led the way along an evil smelling hall and threw open another door in with you he directed the three prisoners were thrust inside and this door was closed and barred they blinked their eyes in the semi-gloom gradually they made out two windows some benches some human derelicts sprawled against the walls they had not even been given the courtesy of a clean private room don carlos and his wife and daughter had been thrust in with the scum of the pueblo with drunkards and thieves and dishonored women and insulting natives they sat down on a bench in one corner of the room as far from the others as possible and then doña catalina and her daughter gave way to tears and tears streamed down the face of the aged don as he tried to comfort them i would to the saints that don diego vega were only my son-in-law now the don breathed his daughter pressed his arm perhaps my father a friend will come she whispered perhaps the evil man who caused the suffering will be punished for it seemed to the senorita that a vision of senor zorro had appeared before her and she had great faith in the man to whom she had given her love end of chapter twenty eight Chapter Twenty Nine of *The Curse of Capistrano* by Johnston Macaulay. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Nine. Don Pulido feels ill. One hour after Don Carlos Pulido and his ladies had been incarcerated in the carcel don diego vega dressed most fastidiously made his way slowly on foot up the slope to the presidio to make his call on his excellency the governor he walked with swinging stride gazing both to right and left as if at the hills in the distance and once he stopped to observe a blossom that bloomed beside the path his rapier was at his side his most fashionable one with its jewelled hilt and in his right hand he carried a handkerchief of flimsy lace which he wafted this way and that like a dandy and now and then touched it to the tip of his nose he bowed ceremoniously to two or three caballeros who passed him but spoke to none beyond the necessary words of greeting and they did not seek conversation with him 
for remembering that they had thought don diego vega was courting the daughter of don carlos they wondered how he would take the matter of her imprisonment along with her father and mother they did not care to discuss the matter for their own feelings were high and they feared they might be betrayed into utterances that might be termed treasonable don diego came to the front door of the presidio and the sergeant in charge called the soldiers to attention giving vega the salute due his station in life don diego answered it with a wave of his hand and a smile and went on to the comandante's office where the governor was receiving such caballeros as cared to call and express their loyalty he greeted his excellency with carefully chosen words bowed over his hand and then took the chair the governor was kind enough to indicate don diego vega the governor said i am doubly glad that you have called upon me to-day for in these times a man who holds high office would know his friends i should have called sooner but i was away from my house at the time you arrived don diego said you contemplate remaining long in reina de los Ailes, excellency until this highwayman known as senor zorro is either slain or taken the governor said by the saints am i never to hear the last of that rogue don diego cried i have heard of nothing else for these many days i go to spend an evening with a fry and in comes a crowd of soldiers chasing this senor zorro i repair to the hacienda of my father to get me peace and quiet and along comes a crowd of caballeros seeking news of senor zorro these be turbulent times a man whose nature inclines him to music and the poets has no right to exist in the present age <laughs> it desolates me that you have been annoyed the governor said laughing but i hope to have the fellow soon and so put an end to that particular annoyance captain ramon has sent for his big sergeant and his troopers to return i brought an escort of twenty and so we have ample men to run down this curse of capistrano when next he makes his appearance let us hope it will end as it should said don diego a man in high office has many things with which to contend the governor went on look at what i was forced to do this day i am called upon to put in prison a man of good blood and his lady wife and tender daughter but the state must be protected i suppose you mean don carlos pulido and his family i do caballero now that it is called to my mind again i must say a few words regarding that don diego said i am not sure that my honor is not involved why caballero how can that be my father has ordered that i get me a wife and set up my establishment properly some days ago i requested of don carlos bolido permission to pay my addresses to his daughter ha i understand but you are not the betrothed of the young lady not yet excellency then your honor is not involved don diego that i can see but i have been paying court to her you may thank the saints that it has gone no further don diego think how it would look if you were allied with this family now as for getting you a wife come north with me to san francisco de assis caballero where the senoritas are far more lovely than here in your southland look over those of good blood and let me know your preference and i'll guarantee that the lady will listen to your suit and accept your hand and name and i can guarantee also that she will be of a loyal family with which it will be no shame to make a contract we shall get you a wife of the proper sort caballero if you will pardon me is it not taking stern measures to have don carlos and his ladies thrown into the carcel don diego asked flicking dust from his sleeve i find it necessary senor do you think it will add to your popularity excellency whether it does or not the state must be served men of good blood hate to see such a thing and there may be murmurings don diego warned i should hate to see your excellency make a wrong step at this juncture what would you have me do the governor asked place don carlos and the ladies under arrest if you will but do not incarcerate them it is unnecessary they will not run away bringing them to trial as gentlefolk should be brought to trial 
You are bold, caballero. By the saints, am I talking too much? It were better to leave these matters to the few of us who are trusted with attention to them. The governor said. I can understand, of course, how it irks a man of good blood to see a don thrown into a carcel, and to see his ladies treated likewise. But in such a case as this— I have not heard the nature of the case. Don Diego said. Ha! Perhaps you may change your mind when you learn it. You have been speaking of this Signor Zorro. What if I tell you that the highwayman has been shielded and protected and fed by Don Carlos Pulido? That is astonishing. And that the Doña Catalina is a party to the treason, and that the lovely Signorita has seen fit to talk treasonably and dip her pretty hands into a conspiracy against the state. This is past belief, Don Diego cried. Some nights ago, Signor Zorro was at the Pulido Hacienda. Warning was fetched the Commandante by a native who is loyal. Don Carlos aided the bandit in tricking the soldiers, hid him in a closet, and when Captain Ramon was there alone, this highwayman stepped from the closet and attacked him treacherously and wounded him. By the saints! And while you were gone and the Pulidos were your house guests, Signor, Signor Zorro was in your house, speaking to the Signorita, when the Comandante walked in upon them, and the Signorita grasped Captain Ramon by the arm and annoyed him until the Signor Zorro had made good his escape. It is past comprehension, Don Diego exclaimed. Captain Ramon has placed before me a hundred such items of suspicion. Can you wonder now that I had placed them in carcel? Did I merely have them put under arrest, this Signor Zorro would combine forces with them and aid them to escape. And your intentions, Excellency? I shall keep them in carcel while my troopers run down this highwayman. I shall force him to confess and implicate them. And then they shall have a trial. These turbulent times, Don Diego complained. As a loyal man, and I hope an admirer of mine, you should hope to see foes of the state confounded. I do, most sincerely do I. All real foes of the state should receive punishment. I am joyed to hear you say that, caballero. The governor cried, and he reached across the table and grasped Don Diego fervently by the hand. There was some more talk that amounted to nothing, and then Don Diego took his leave, for there were other men waiting to see the governor. After he had left the office, the governor looked across at Captain Ramon and smiled. You are right, Comandante, he said. Such a man could not be a traitor. It would tire him too much to think treasonable thoughts. What a man! He must be enough to drive that old fire-eater of a father of his insane. Don Diego made his way slowly down the hill, greeting those he passed, and stopping again to regard the little flowers that blossomed by the wayside. At the corner of the plaza he met a young caballero who was glad to call him friend, one of the small band of men who had spent the night at Don Alejandro's hacienda. Ah, oh, Don Diego, a fair day to you, he cried, and then he lowered his voice and stepped nearer. Has by any chance the man we call leader of our League of Avengers sent you a message this day? by the bright blue sky no don diego said why should the man this polido business it seems an outrage some of us have been wondering whether our leader does not intend to take a hand in it we have been anticipating a message by the saints oh i trust not don diego said i could not enjoy an adventure of any sort tonight. i uh, my head aches, and I fear I am going to have a fever. I should have to see an apothecary about it. There are shiverings up and down my spine also. Is not that a symptom? During this yester hour I was bothered with a pain in my left leg just above the knee. It must be the weather. Let us hope that it will not result seriously. <laughs> His friend laughed and hurried on across the plaza. End of chapter 29